Hello and welcome to today's webcast, Uncovering the Redback Report. My name is Vesna, I'm from Redback and I'll be your host for today's event. Today is all about uncovering the Redback Report, a research study that was launched in May. We found out some very interesting facts from this report today and we have Sarah Gonzalez and Michael Bunker from Redback Conferencing to discuss them. How are you both today? Very well, thank Very well, you. thank you. It's, it's great to be here. I think um, we said, uh, and everyone who's registered and joining today, we 2013 was when we launched this report, I and know. now we're actually we've gone this far. So some very interesting insights um, that we're excited to share with you. Um, and just a note for everyone out there: um, as we go through the report, we're, report, we're going to talk a little bit about on-demand recordings and how to do stuff when stuff doesn't work, because you know sometimes technology and other things in life can get in the way. Um, we were supposed to do this as a live event, however circumstances have come up and one of us won't be able to attend. So this is actually an on-demand webcast. So just one of the things that you can actually do that we're streaming live. Um, the aim of today is to showcase the report um, and give you all the information that we promised to do so. Um, however, we still are going to take questions. So please type in your questions. We will respond to you personally afterwards. But we do have some pre-questions that we are going to go through. Um, but yeah, it's great to be here, Michael. That's great. Yes. Beautiful. So let's get started. Can you tell us a little bit about the respondents and the report itself? Yes. Yeah, so um, as you'll see on this slide, um, we had 236 people complete the survey. Mm -hmm. And like I said, we did start in 2013, but when we started, we had no idea what to expect, how many people would complete it and how far it would actually go. So one of the things that we really wanted to uncover that, you know, with online events, there seemed to be you send out an invitation, people register and then you join. However, so much has changed in terms of technology and people's experiences and people are becoming really demanding. So as we go through this, you're going to pick up some tips and you're going to pick up some tricks that will obviously help you. Um, but just take this as um, some content that can guide you in your online programs. Think about your experiences as an attendee and see this as an opportunity to enhance your online events. And there's just some interesting stats there just in terms of um, the industry itself and where it's going. So as a company, we actually hosted over 1,300 online managed events in 2015. So that's grown rapidly since 2013. Um, and the global managed webinar market itself is estimated to reach over US $600 million by 2019. So it's a growing market. We need to start talking about it and we need to start uncovering some information that's going to make us better organizers so our attendees can have better experiences. Um, now, Vesna, just in regards to the other pe um, the people who did complete it, we did actually break it down uh, per industry sector. So we broke it down into corporate, government and third sector. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things that we found um, is that there's a significant increase in those partaking in online events, especially from the corporate sector. Um, so people are really now starting to think outside the square. They're delivering more events that are tailored to internal comms as well as external comms. And as we go through the report, we're going to be breaking it down into ind industry sector. So hopefully that will also be able to guide you that little bit further. Beautiful, thank you. So we can see that the report and online events have grown significantly. Why are people joining online events? We've got some research here, but I think Michael's got a few great opinions as to why people are joining and even more so. Well, yeah, like the difference definitely is nowadays is that we still have people doing the traditional education and personal mm. development. That's still the biggest in our marketplace. Corporate's coming up, just like you said before. Mm. That's one of the biggest changes that we're seeing right now is that a lot of people are using... Uh, webinars for corporate comms, corporate communication, stakeholder engagements, and internal briefings. Mm. It's a much easier way for especially your bigger companies that have a dispersed employee network to be able to get everyone to join together, to get everyone to communicate together, and also feel included in discussions as mm. well, where you can't do that when you're traveling from office to office trying to run the same thing. Okay. But as we can see, yeah. learning and education is still, the still biggest. so popular. And I think a lot of people come, Vesna, and they say, oh, you know, we've been running these programs. Is it a bit old school now? Are people, you know, running too many webinars? Is there too much online education? But it's just really beginning here in Australia. So for anyone out there looking to host online training, development, educational programs, it's not about doing it. It's about doing it better, better than other Better, smarter, people. and also monetizing correctly. Yes, exactly. Yeah. So it's very exciting space. Yes. No, definitely. And you're saying that people People have become a lot more flexible and doing things on the go. Mm -hmm. Michael, can you tell us a little bit about accessibility and what the report has actually uncovered about this? Sure can. So when we started this back in 2013, I think probably one of the biggest things we ever thought mm -hmm. that was going to take off with accessibility was the whole mobile movement. And everyone nowadays has a mobile device, but from the stats you can see on the screen, that hasn't been the case, mm -hmm. especially for live delivery. And I think this is something that we kind of missed in the report was how people look at content versus live versus on demand. Mm -hmm. Live content, you want to be able 
able to have that great user experience where you have the slides in front of you and the video. But when you watch it off a mobile device, especially some of them, uh, iPhone in particular, you only get the video. So then you sacrifice half of the presentation. You don't see the slide content. You wouldn't be able to see the graphs right now or anything because our, the native player on that will maximize the whole screen. So the benefits of being able to do it on your laptop or your PC is you're in a comfortable environment. You can sit back and relax. You might have your headphones plugged mm. in. If you're at home or the office as well, not office, but if at home, have a glass of wine with it. On-demand accessibility, I think, is the biggest movement that we'll see, and that's because Netflix, everyone wants to watch content mm. in their own time. But at least with mobile devices, you can watch it on the way to work, from work, on the way to meetings, all of that. You can play catch up with it. Mm. And I think it's what we'll have to do in the next report next year is see if we can kind of split the market on how they're yeah. looking at things. Yeah, and I think um, it, one of the interesting things I found so fascinating about, about, about this is once upon a time, or back in 2013, yeah. everyone's talking about mobile yeah. and how you need to have everything accessible <laughs> from your Apple or your Android. And that is true with yes. some applications, but when it does come to webinars and when it does come to learning, more specifically, Specifically, it hasn't really increased that much. No. So people did get to a stage where they were freaking out and it was all about when they were looking for providers and when they were looking to what they were going to present. Yep. How is this going to come across on my mobile device? And you think about sitting there with an event like this, especially a collaborative event where you're invited to partake in polling and surveys and Q&A yeah. on a little iPhone this big. And it's like, <laughs> yeah. oh, well, are you really getting the best user experience? So yep. I think our advice here is to with that sort of stuff, just don't worry about it too much. Always give people instructions on how they should be, on yeah. how they can join from a mobile device because people still are on the go. Um, and with, as technology gets sophisticated, I'm sure it will increase. But don't make this your top priority when you are looking to your no. events. You've only got 5 to 6% of people wanting to join by it anyway. So yeah. cater for them, but don't make them the primary. Mm -hmm. yeah. No, most definitely. And uh, so I'm going to ask just a really big question now. Paying for online events, yes. it's always a bit of a sticky topic. Yep. Um, so how much are people willing to pay, if at all, for online events? Yeah, and you're right. This is some, People come up to us all the time and they say, okay, well, I want to run an event. How much can I make from it? It's like, oh, well, it's how long how is a piece, piece of Yeah, like it's one of those things you just don't know. And it's yeah. different for your industry, different for your audience, and also different when it comes to perceived value. So if we just take a look at the report now, um, as we can see, making money has been a huge topic and everyone wants to know. But when it comes to actually charging for online events, more people are willing to put their hands in their pocket. Mm -hmm. And I think it's because we're now delivering more value with our online events. We now understand that, and we'll go into this later, that when we're hopping online, we need to give people content yes. and value. We can't just get on there and sell a product. We need to give them a great experience that encompasses technology, delivery, your presenter, yep. so many different things that roll into it. Um, so as we can see, there's a huge increase in those willing to pay between $50 and $100, just even looking at the third sector. So in 20... Um, 2015, um, third sector, you had 4% of people willing yeah. to pay that amount. That's now jumped to 13%. And also the wouldn't pay factor has gone down as well. So I think it's it's one of those things you really have to look at as an organisation and consider if you're running a program, for example, over 12 months, are you actually running a program where maybe every third event or something you will charge because you might have a special guest speaker or something like that? Um, or if you are running just one or two webinars and you're going to charge for that, how do your people know they're going to get value? Oh, yeah. um, but I would also, and I think I'll hand this over to you, when it does come to monetizing your online yeah. events, that could be a whole 45-minute session on its own. Oh, my God, yeah. Think of some other ways that you can also make money from your online event. Yeah. So um, I know you've dealt a lot with sponsorship in the past. Yeah, and definitely. I think sponsorships are one of the most underutilized things when coming to digital events. Whether it be a webinar series or a webcast, you have people who will sponsor your physical events, and that's a one-day sponsorship. That's a leaflet to go in, like the mm. delegate bag. That's a pull-up banner. But just like this, is a branded webcast page that we're on right now, this content's going to live for a minimum of 12 months. Sponsorship for that value, when you have, we have over 300 people registered for today's event, that's exposure to 300 people, then that content after this is going to have its own dedicated campaign about the on-demand and getting more people there. So your sponsorship's value is way, it's mm. a lot higher. The return on investment is a lot greater, and you can put in soft call to actions. So around the player page, we can have buttons saying, learn about our sponsor, why have they sponsored? Mm. And even those click to call for like buy now discounts, all of that is underutilized space where I think the strategy for people running webinars, and right now, like especially on charging for webinars, we've had it in the past that everyone's attended a bad webinar. We've done it. Mm -hmm. We've hosted bad webinars in the past, but we've been doing this for seven Not years many. now. Not many, but a couple. <laughs> we've done a couple. But that's the thing is that right now people are smarter about what they're doing. They're trying to have better content, better speakers, and people are now seeing a difference so they're willing to pay for it. It's not yeah. like five years ago with a stigma of, oh my God, a webinar. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to give money 
for that, where they know now that the caliber of speakers is higher, mm -hmm. the topics are higher, and also especially for personal development and all of that, you're getting CPD points, you're actually getting something tangible mm. afterwards. Yeah. yeah. And I think, you know, across all sectors, as we can see, if you are going into this and you want to monetize your events and charging is yeah. one way that you want to actually do that, then I wouldn't be looking at anything more than $50. Oh, God, no. As you can see here, that's quite an overall spread. Um, but you, like I said, you need to give something. We're becoming, a lot of industries and a lot of people are becoming saturated with webinars and yes. webcasts now. So if you do decide to charge, I think for a lot of people, if I get an invitation to webinar that's paid for I'm like oh well it must be good and yeah. there must be some sort of value but yeah. give me something you know what are you going to give to me afterwards am I getting CPD points am I getting something complimentary afterwards like a training session or something like that and also maybe give me a free webinar to attend beforehand so I can actually see how great your webinars might be and then I would be willing to pay so it's really about thinking strategically when it comes to monetizing your online events and also just thinking not just about okay here's a dollar sign and yeah. let's put it out there and <laughs> see who actually pays. Um, like Michael said, it's about sponsorship. Yep. It's about finding other smart ways that tie into your overall marketing plan. And I think the biggest thing, um, if anyone can take away today, is to start thinking of webinars as your overall content marketing strategy. Yes. So you go out there, you launch your white papers, you launch your blogs, and then your webinars sort of sit there, sit there separately. Yep. And I think for a lot of people, that's where they do go wrong because they don't bring it all in together. Mm -hmm. They don't um, talk about the return on investment as part of their overall plan. And there's so many smart things you can do when it comes to, well, even this, for example, yep. you know, you launch a report, you bring out the written content, you do a webinar on it, you can then edit that into, you know, 10 bite-sized chunks or something yep. like that. You can actually do so much with on-demand video content now, um, which is actually a really good segue into this next <laughs> section, um, which is live and on-demand. So that's what you spoke about earlier, the live and on-demand yeah. stuff. But I think, you know, this is, this is also very important. It is. And like live versus on demand, I think a lot of people forget about the on demand element. You get so caught up in your live event and you don't want to end up having an event where you put so much effort into and they're like, okay, done. I'm going to walk away from this event. Mm. It was a success. But that's half the battle. For 40 to 50% of attendants um, that register will only attend the live. Everyone else wants that on demand. Mm. We talked about Netflix before and all the other hosting environments out there. And people want to watch content in their leisure. I get immersed with so many different webinar invitations a week and I do that because I want to see what other people are doing in the market but I only attend maybe 5% of webinars mm -hmm. that I register mm -hmm. for because I am that inundated by them because I've signed up for so many. Yeah and I think you know this stat is going to it's quite hard because there's a few numbers here so yeah. just bear with me for a sec. So out of all online events attended between 2015 and 2016 only 29% of respondents admit to attending them 100% yes. of them live. live. 13% yeah. of people actually said they've never attended an event line mm -hmm. live. They simply register so they can receive the recording afterwards. And I'm going to put my hand up because I do, I do that yeah. as well um, because you know you're going to get that content. And that's an 8% increase on a year. Yeah. So you think of that just going up, up and up. But I think a lot of people are just so anti it when it comes to on demand and their return on investment is actually having attendees online mm. whereas you know is your return on investment more about the long-term goal yes. and not just having those people online because my theory is if you do send a webinar invitation out and you do get 100 people register and you do get 50 people online you've engaged those 50 people mm -hmm. those other 50 people who didn't attend they if they did attend they wouldn't be engaged for some reason or another and like you alluded to the whole Netflix yep. and stand and on-demand content I want to watch something in my own time and there's more chance that I am then going to be engaged oh God, yeah. in that content. So if I'm busy or doing something and I know I'm going to get it afterwards, then why wouldn't I get that? And as an organiser, start measuring the on-demand. So we're, we get so caught up when it comes to data and we just measure the live attendees and people online yeah. and then we send out the recording then we move on to the next one and we don't actually then use the, an on-demand on video portal or even YouTube or in, embed yep. it into your uh, website to actually say okay over the next three months I'm now going to measure how many people come back and I guarantee you, you'll get three times as many people watching that on-demand content yep. as a minimum than you would when you're watching it live because it's people you're attracting such a wider audience and people are going to come back and watch it once or twice. Yep. 
And I think one of the biggest things that gets missed right now, especially for the third sector in government, is a lot of the grant funding that's out there for digital events and communications is all based around the live. Mm. So they only get measured on live submissions of the feedback form, live interaction and engagement during it, where that's a big piece that's missed, is mm. you are truly engaged if you and your own free time are taking it to go out and sit on that, to go to that piece of content, watch it, but that's the other time where you have more time to engage with call to actions around the page, click here to learn information, click here to be contacted mm. about maybe my CPD program or about the government funding that's been used for this. Having on-demand strategy, I think, is a lot more important nowadays than it is for the live because mm. you do miss out on such a big area of their marketplace, especially with live attendance. But in saying that, you never want to get rid of your live. Live is probably the most most engaging times you'll ever have with your audience because out of those 50% of people that actually attend, they're the ones who want to either buy now, learn now, mm -hmm. ask a question, you'll get the best Q&A from them. That's, you definitely just need to make sure when you are having a strategy around this, you have one for your live and one for your on demand. Yeah. And how do they come together? Beautiful. Thank you. Really interesting information there. Uh, so let's get into when to host webinars and webcasts. Yes. So Michael, what day of the week works best? Well, look, and uh, there's a lot of information up on the <laughs> screen right now. So take a moment to have a look at this. Just breathe. Just breathe. <laughs> and don't take this as gospel because every organization and yes. every sector is always different. And what works for someone in your sector isn't necessarily going to work for you. So if we look here right now, Tuesday and Wednesdays are still our biggest days of the week and mm. they always will be. And I think it's just because a lot of people say Monday is I'm just getting into my week Tuesday I feel I'm a little bit more relaxing on my week planned out so mm -hmm. I will join it but I really like the stats right here around like government government on a Friday uh, sorry, corporate. Corporate on a Friday had a massive jump, and we never would have even suspected that that was a really mm. key time for corporates to be doing webinars. And as I started talking to more of my friends in the space, they're like, look, Friday afternoon, when people are starting to unwind and everything, managers are being smart and saying, okay, guys, instead of you just sitting there and mm. having a chat, let's do an internal comms, an internal training, a briefing for next week. And they're getting a lot higher submission rate on there. Same thing with just the third sector. Um, for Wednesdays, uh, they've jumped, they've gone down, surprisingly. I was mm. quite surprised by this. They went from a massive 35% down to an 11%, but they've increased on their Tuesday. And even with us, when we deliver over 120 mm. managed webinars uh, a month, the Tuesdays are our busiest day. So you get a lot of competition on that day. And I think that's another important thing to say is that the marketplace most content gets delivered on Tuesdays, so why not be different? Why not start shifting it to Wednesday or mm. Thursday when people have more free time as well? And I think um, day of the week as well, and we, we're stressing the importance of your audience yes. and the people that you're working with, but it does play a massive role. So it also, like I said, going back to the fact that if you what, what, do you, what else do you have going on as part of your content marketing strategy or your online training program or something yeah. like that? It does have to work in with that. But also, um, even your industry and the people who you're targeting, if I run an association that's targeted to dentists, for example, yeah. are they going to be able to join when they're looking down people's mouths from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. or something no. like that? Or is that where we go more into the afternoon, the late, sec uh, late sections of the day? And I think that's where a lot of learning and development, that's going to change yes. over the next few years. And I think that's where on-demand content has really played a key role in this mm -hmm. because people, they're doing their job, they get home, they want to do their learning on demand. And it's really hard to please everyone. And in the past, we used to say, go out to your audience, ask them when they want mm -hmm. to join or you know, get some feedback from them. The reality is when you ask that question, you get seven different responses for seven different days yes. and you're never going to please everyone. So then you alienate people by not agreeing to what they want to agree with. So I've sort of changed my thinking mm -hmm. on that, going out and asking people. I think it's more important to actually tie it into your overall plan and also make sure that you're being consistent with the days. Um, I know if I know there's certain organisations and they have regular webinars where I can actually hop online, learn something educational, mm -hmm. and they're like 30 minutes, really short and snappy, and I know they're on the same day, same time, every fortnight. And to me, that just is something that I've got a reminder yeah. of all the time, yeah. and I think that works really well. Um, but yeah, I definitely understand um, that it's an industry thing, oh, but I also think it's about testing the waters, getting that feedback, but then not having to be so specific with it that you have to answer everyone. So if you're running events, maybe do a three-month trial or something like that, see the attendance. If that doesn't work, then that's your feedback as opposed to going out there and actually asking people in an email or something like that. And definitely when you are going back to your audience and asking them for the feedback, 
don't ask them, say, out of the week, which mm. day, only give them two options. Saying, mm. look, out of these two days, Tuesdays and Wednesdays, which one will you attend more? Yep. So you're limiting the responses as well. So it's just going to make it a little bit easier for you. Yeah. So then a good segue for us to talk about time of the day. And that's a really key one. And that is exactly what Sarah said before. What works for you and your industry may not work for the other person. So we'll use a dentist again or just medical. So we work with a lot of associations in the medical space who are targeting doctors or physicians. They cannot attend during the day. They just can't. And we've seen a lot of people try to do these during lunch breaks because they think it's going to work, but doctors and everything, they're too busy. And out of hours, 7 p.m. works best for them. Mm -hmm. So we can see here... I get another big graph, but we've got early morning, midday, afternoons, uh, mid morning, and that. Um, what are some of the key ones from the session? Sorry. So, government is still the morning which is really good for them. So 23% to 40% in this year. So government's actually increased quite a lot, uh, especially for submissions back in this report since 2013 when we first started, which is great to see. Uh, third sector. Uh, for the middle of the for mid mornings is still good. So mm -hmm. overall, forty percent. Um, and I think I just I just find it interesting that it's always a mid morning time yeah. slot for a lot of people. And I think if we just put ourselves in their position or anyone's position when you're trying to digest information, when you first get into the office in the morning, you have a bit of a routine. Yeah. You do what you need to do. Then you've got your lunch break, and then you've got your afternoon where things you know trying to finish stuff off or work on deadlines or something. And that's why I think mid morning has increased quite yeah. a fair bit because people. Are now they're leaving that time to either start something and or finish it and it's just I don't know it just seems to really resonate with people and we're talking if it's mid in the past we used to say 60 minute webinar for example yeah. 60 minutes mid morning is a lot of time to actually put yeah. aside to do something if you're doing shorter snappier pieces of content yeah. delivering them online and you're looking to the half an hour to 45 minute mark I think that resonates with a lot of people it's a lot easier to commit to exactly as you yes. said 60 minutes takes up your whole hour break where if you can give someone in the mid morning an extra 15 minutes to then go mm. afterwards to get a sandwich and get ready for the next meeting yeah. it's a lot easier to commit to and we're finding that as a good trend but yeah even as you said the 30 minute webinars they're starting to creep mm. up now and that's a good 20 minutes on a topic and 10 minutes of q a but also being extremely diligent with that time and mm. not going over it's a big pet peeve out there yeah and we look at duration now and i think yeah. in the past like i said um, a lot of people were looking more towards the 60 minute mark yeah. um, and then last year a lot of people actually did try out the 15 minute just to see how it would go short, yeah. i think it is a little bit too short um, but once again you do need to consider your audience but I think the reason why we're now seeing a shift in people go down from the 60 minute to either a 30 or a 45 minute is it's a mental thing for a lot of people. So if I'm going to attend a 60-minute event, I'm actually then going, oh, do you know what? I have to dedicate more than 60 minutes to attend this yeah. event because by yeah. the time I log on, then they might start a little bit later, then the Q&A might go over, yeah. and there's 70 minutes or something worked up. If I know that this event is going to go for 45 minutes, I know there's 45 minutes of content delivery that's yeah. going to be happening, maybe 30 in a 15 Q&A session, and then I only have to dedicate 60 minutes of my day to actually do that if it does go over or whatnot but yeah. I think the biggest things here um, is really not to start start seeing your in, um, return investment based on the attendance rates at peak so for example if you're running a webinar and you're doing it for 60 minutes and you're going back through the data at the end and you can see that the 30 30 minute mark 80% of your audience actually drops off. Mm -hmm. That's saying something. That's saying yeah. something about your presenter or the content that's been yeah. delivered, but it's also then saying something that maybe 30 minutes is enough time for some people to digest that content. Um, so really start looking at the data that you're running. And like we said at the beginning, this report is a great way to get some insights into what is happening, the latest trends, but your audience, your webinars, and the people who you are trying to get online and build this community with is going to be different for every single person coming on. Yeah. Oh, definitely, yeah. Great. Uh, so we're going to move on to platform preferences now. Yep. So there is so much you can do with the platform. They're really interactive. You can have polls, mm. surveys, all sorts of things. Uh, so what are you finding? What really matters? And why do people leave events early? And what things are they really engaging with? Hmm, interesting. <laughs> so this is um, one of the things that we ask every year and I find it, it's actually, we're becoming much more tolerant of information yes. online now. Um, so 71% of people actually admitted to leaving an event early. Um, that's down from 89%. So let's all pat ourselves on the back well because it um, means that our events are becoming more engaging. And we know we hear the word engaging so many times and it's just on and on and on, but your events do need to be engaging. Um, there are a few mistakes that yep. people run. So as we can see here, 
The reasons why people want to leave early, salesy content, you get online and then someone just starts selling to you right away and you need to have a call to action at the end but be really mindful and make it at the end and don't wrap a, you know, Demtel steak knife at around <laughs> it because that's what you, you don't need to do that. The lack of marketing presenter alignment. So... I've been in situations before where I've registered for events or been hosting an event for someone um, and as a, as a presenter, you go out, you give your information to someone marketing an event, they then promote it in a certain way. From that moment, there's no alignment with the presenter mm -hmm. and the person promoting it. So all of a sudden people register based on the promotional material that's gone out. The presenter hops online and they're talking about something completely different because marketers obviously want to get the most attendees and the presenters want to present their content. So the goals really need to be aligned. Um, and you get online and all of a sudden you don't have the line and you will see people drop off like flies and even get well, nasty yeah, yeah. at times. <laughs> so one of the things um, we do even with today's event, we said to people in the registration process, um, you know, what are you looking to gain out of this? Or you could even do a poll at the beginning and say, you know, what are the top three things that you want us to discuss today or something like that. So then your presenter is in line with the people who are actually attending. Yep. And it's one of those things that is usually missed because a lot of people just say, oh, let's just get people online and they've just, that's the marketing promotional stage. When the presenter comes online, that's their time to actually show off and do what they need to do best. But if you're not aligned from the beginning, that's where a lot of people are now going, oh, do you know what, is it even worth it? And I think in this environment, you need to make sure that you get one chance to do it well. Otherwise, yeah. Um, in the past, I think the biggest thing was people had to worry about was the event running over time. Yes. That's all it was. And they're like, oh, you know, that means my webinar didn't go that well because the event ran over and it's the presenter's fault. It's not. Everyone needs to take accountability for these events. They need to keep it educational. You need to remember your goals and use call to actions to actually capture what you need to. Um, but even little things such as long intros and bios, how many times have you hopped on a webinar and you see the presenter come on or facilitate like yourself, Vesna, and they read out four paragraphs of the presenter and all their credentials. And as, as a, someone joining an online event, I'm like, okay, first of all, Two minutes in webinar land is like 20 minutes in real life. Even if you take a break and a bit of silence, people are like, oh, God, what's wrong? What's happening in technology? What's happening? <laughs> but... If you've registered for an event, chances are you know who the presenter is. You've probably stalked them on LinkedIn. You know a lot about them. To then get online and for the first two minutes actually sit there and hear someone go through all their credentials and how successful they are, I, I don't want to hear that. I just want you to get into the content, get into it early and make sure that I'm investing my time wisely. Yeah, no, most definitely. Good. There is nothing more annoying than someone that just talks about themselves. Yes, yeah, so exactly. exactly. <laughs> okay, so let's talk about PowerPoint slides. So they're very important, surely. So, Michael, what elements of a PowerPoint slide are important and what should be incorporated and what makes a really good interactive presentation? Definitely, like PowerPoint slides, it's always, it's always going to be around. People want to have mm -hmm. them there. It does, it's a great way for conveying your message, especially like we're doing today. We have large-scale graphs, which you can see on the screen, and they're color-coded. They're easy to digest, and we're not doing death by a text. Mm -hmm. One of the biggest mistakes everyone does out there is they'll just put all their text on the PowerPoint slide, but then they'll just read to it. And that's not what you want to do. You want people actually talking about the content on the slide, but not directly reading from it. So one mm -hmm. of the biggest faux pas that you can do on this for it. And yeah, you just want to make them bright, colorful, easy to read and understand, and make sure that they are in line with what you're presenting on. Um, so that's what it definitely PowerPoint slides are clear and easy to read. Uh, and the other thing is that the presenter is engaged and keeps me focused. Mm -hmm. And that's one thing. The PowerPoint slides are meant to help you keep uh, mm -hmm. the topic going, but it's also to make sure that uh, the presenter is engaging with their audience. They're a little bit larger than life. You are using technology, which is a barrier because they're not sitting in the room with you, so you do have to be a little bit more animated. Yeah, and this goes into um, the next part of the report, yeah. which we're going to talk about. So when it does come to any sort of these interactive tools, what is most important? So I think, um, you know, PowerPoints are important, Vesna, and they do need to be clear and they need yeah. to actually illustrate the points that you're talking about. But if you look at the results and only 2% of people said that it's very important yeah. to them. Yeah. So it's like, oh, well, you know, are we focusing too much on the PowerPoint slides and not focusing on the rest of the content? So if you look here, when it comes to the number one thing that is most important when people are joining webinars, they're saying that the content delivered is what it says it's going yes. to be. 48% of people <laughs> actually said that. So I think, you know, that's more than doubled since 2013 and that says a lot. And I think it really says, you know, sometimes you do all these fancy polls and you bring yep. out these Q&As and you do all these surveys, but I just want great content that I can walk away with. Yep. Um, and I think if you're going to engage, it's not about just using tools for the sake of it. It's about working with your presenter to make sure that they're enthusiastic, knowledgeable and understand yes. what's happening. But it's about delivering that content 
and then setting those expectations. So like I said before, if you promote a webinar and you're going out and you're promising people, okay, you will walk away you knowing these three things and here's what we're going to cover, make sure they walk away with those three things yeah, and what definitely. you've promised you're going to cover. Otherwise, to someone attending online, that's poor content. And, and you can put as many polls up as you like and you can make it as interactive as you like. But as you can see here, 48% of people just care about that. That's mm -hmm. the most important thing. And if you compare that to the audio quality, audio quality is huge for someone, but more people, only 10% of people are saying that's important compared to the content. So it's telling us something and it's making sure, I think people are just had enough. That's funny though, because like you kind of need good audio quality to get the content out there. So, yeah. so when that stat came through, it does make me giggle a little bit because yeah, you do want the content to be delivered and what it's about to say, but you kind of need that audio quality. I, I definitely <laughs> agree with that, but I think for a lot of people, that's just so front of mind for them yeah. now. It's the content. Yeah, it is. Yeah. And yeah. so when people ask you a question, that's the first thing they think of straight away. Whereas, you know, you know, three years ago, people weren't saying that. They were no. worried about PowerPoint presentations and they were making sure they were using as many pol polls as they yeah. could. Um, but, you know, if you look, like I said here, 2% of people only worried about the PowerPoint. And while it, I think it's a catch-22 because as an organiser, you do need to take all of these into an account yes. when you're running an event. So you can't focus on the content and then have a really poor PowerPoint presentation. So I think one of the things to take out of this section especially is these, these are work mm -hmm. and you can't just put on a webinar and expect people to join and walk away with great feedback. It's about taking all of these things, especially in this section here, into consideration and the presenter as well, 27% of people. I really don't know why I had that dip. The 16% yeah. last year, I find that really bizarre. But I think, you know, um, we've got a presenter handbook that we'll send yeah. out to everyone after this as well. And it's really about making sure your presenter might know the content, but people sit there behind a webinar and, you know, they've presented to hundreds of people yep. before on a regular basis. And, you know, we've all seen it. You sit there and the presenter freaks out because they're behind the camera and they switch into formal mode. They sit there, they have their arms crossed, they look around, they don't know yeah. how to interact. <laughs> and all of a sudden, you're dealing with a robot. So with your presenter, it's about yeah. making sure they know their content, but making sure that they've been trained how to present online and just keep it casual. Yeah. You know, the formal tones and the scripts and everything don't really work or having a discussion like we're doing yeah. now, I think works quite well. I think the um, biggest thing is passion and enthusiasm. Mm. So even though you can have a product knowledge expert or someone that comes in, and maybe even your product expert for your company might not be the best person to present on it because they might know the technical aspects of it, but they're not passionate about yes. selling it. Maybe get the salesperson who's always engaging with the audience because a person that can convey passion and enthusiasm will be highly, uh, he'll be always rated higher than the actual slide of the content mm, for it. Definitely. So yeah, big attributes there. And then you know these other things that we speak about as well. So the registration process. Yes. yes. Making that quick and easy. I think that you know these all fall into different sections you know your before during and your after and if yes. we're speaking the before section where we're talking about marketing and presenter alignment and making sure the process is easy that's the best way to gain respondents if you and measuring your conversion rate so um, with most programs out there or if you are doing managed events with a service provider they should be able to tell you how many people are getting to your landing page and then not converting yes. and what are you doing wrong when people are registering for these events and you know when people register sometimes you're used to running um, live events so you run these webinars and all of a sudden you've got 20 fields that people need to complete <laughs> you can capture so much more information within the platform yes. so all you really need to know is someone's email address and first name as soon as they enter the webinar you can launch a survey yep. if you want yep. to understand their company name. You can launch another a poll, poll to if find you out like. where they're coming from around the country. Yeah, you could ask them, you know, where are you joining from today? Please type in your answer, yep. and then you can collect all that afterwards as well. So, really start to think of it as not what just what you want, but what's going to make it a great experience for your audience. And then, how can you work backwards and then capture that information within the actual platform? It's a really key thing, especially when you're doing series of mm. events. You never want to have anything more than I recommend five registration fields. Mm. And for your series, you can then change each one of those. So those five for the next episodes, yes. or the next ones of them. So the first one might be first name, last name, email, company, and mm. mobile number. The next ones can be state, and yep. so forth. You can build upon it and use the features as Sarah just said. But the other thing I find really interesting is how we're seeing such a decline coming down from like the technology mm. seamless. Technology, people are just getting used to it now. Mm. There's not a scary platform. So many people have been on them. They know a couple of different platforms by now because you've been across a bunch of different ones. I think just the biggest thing to go out to market is when you're looking for a technology provider, find someone that offers support. You don't want to be taking the support mm. questions. You want to make sure, or the support calls, get someone that can do that for you because it just makes it a lot easier for you when running your events. Exactly, and like you said, I think a lot of people go into this or they start to enhance their program and they question technology and they spend so much time worrying about it. Webinar platform, 
platforms would not be out there still if yes. they didn't work. <laughs> and it does work. And, you know, there are going to be hiccups because it is technology along the way. But I think if you spend too much time focusing on this and getting yourself down and just worrying about that, you will neglect the other aspects. So the biggest thing with technology is finding a provider that can work with you and, like you said, remove the burden. Yeah. In the live environment, when everything's happening and you're worried and you're sitting there, is this going to work? I need to do with my presenter. I need to get people online. Let the provider deal with the technology. And if something happens, the burden's on them. And then you can go back and say, okay, well, yeah. what happened? Yeah. Ask for a trial beforehand to give yourself peace of mind. Do mm -hmm. something just to make sure that you're not neglecting other parts. Because I think a lot of people just get caught up, too caught up in it. And then you don't know the technology. Yep. A lot of us don't know the technology. We don't know <laughs> yeah. what happens behind the scenes. And let's just leave it that way and let the experts deal with it. Definitely. And then I think, you know, the interactive tools is something interesting as well. Like, I love a poll as much as the next person, but I think once again, sit on your attendee's point of view. We've all attended webinars and if you're going to run a webinar program, you need to go out and you need to attend webinars to yeah. see what works yes. and what doesn't and then you can actually mix up the process. So if you, as an attendee, if I'm sitting there, I'm using all these sensors, I'm listening, I'm watching, I'm learning, I'm asking questions, I'm typing, I'm watching the presenter, they might be on a webcam, then you launch polls and all these these things are happening around me and all of a sudden I'm like, well, I haven't listened to anything that you said because I've been too focused on doing all these things that you're yeah. asking me to do. So keep it really relevant, you know. Keep it simple and there's definitely a time and place for yeah. using them. There's, you don't need to launch a bunch of different polls yeah. for it, but I think an important thing to look at is if you are going to choose to use interactive tools, do something with the information. Yeah. Don't launch a poll without actually utilizing that information for maybe for the post follow-up saying that, look, 65% of our attendance from the live event said X. That's yeah. a new promotional tool piece for you. And it's just another way of actually showing that you've listened to your audience and you've done something with that information. Yeah, and there's nothing worse. It's, it's like any sort of feedback. You know, you collect that feedback and no. you don't do anything with it and you alienate people. Even subconsciously, they're like, oh, well, I asked you this and you didn't do this. And I think um, if you're an attendee on an event and you sit back and people ask you a poll, you know, how do you feel about A, B, C and D? Okay, done. Let's move on now. Yeah. And you're just sitting there <laughs> going, well, why did I do that? What was the point of that? You need to keep it relevant. You need to have your presenter think about the format. You need a facilitator. There's a few different different aspects that go into it but once again what works for one person isn't necessarily going to work for the next person. Exactly. Yeah no most definitely for every different presentation has to be different. I usually suggest to people to sort of break it up into segments yes. but depending on the presentation again obviously but you know at the beginning to sort of ask an icebreaker mm. or you know what do you want covered yeah. Yeah. and that's really good. Perfect. Okay so let's move on to the good and the bad memories. So yeah. I think for the report, uh, we asked people to talk about their most memorable moments. So let's have a look now. <laughs> Just um, something fun to finish up on, yeah. I guess. Um, oh, and, good you know, <laughs> if you do, um, also, if you do have any questions, like we said, um, please type them through um, the chat box and we will get um, back to you, even if you want some advice on the programs you're running or even if you're thinking, oh, you know, I'm thinking of doing this, but I don't really think it's the right way or you want some more examples of webinars or you want some more content. Otherwise, you can go down to the resources folder. Um, but please complete the survey so we can get feedback from you guys as well. Um, but let's take a look at this because um, we've got the good here, so that's always something to start on. Um, we asked people the most memorable moments, so the technology was faultless and I enjoyed the interactive learning mm -hmm. through audience polling. So that's someone who is thinking more about technology and interactive tools as yep. opposed to content. Um, just give me an enthusiastic presenter with a simple slide deck. <laughs> Some people are quite easy to please. Yes, they are. <laughs> and we've got a few others here as well. I like it when the presenter asks questions of the people signed in and is engaging and keeps it flowing and also makes people are paying attention. So um, in a live environment as a facilitator or presenter, and this is more for experienced presenters, if they're sitting there and they're saying, OK, um, you know, Jen, what do you think about this? Or actually calling people out. Um, some environments doesn't always work that well because you are sort of putting people on the spot. But, yeah. um, but if you are working with an engaged community and you are running regular webinars with these people, and you'll see as you start to form a program and you have a community, people come online, they start chatting with each other, and they've never met, but they're always communicating through this webinar platform. So be like, oh, hi, Vesna, how are you? <laughs> How's things going yeah. over there? And you start to build this engaged community. Um, the bad, they're not so good, let's call it that. Um, so there we go, once I joined um, an upgrade learning webinar, which turned out to be a sales platform for a yes. product, and yes. there's nothing worse. And what we need to think of is I go to conferences and I'll sit there and there'll be a lot of presenters who will get up and they'll talk about their product. And I sit yeah. there and I'm like, well, I don't want to stand up. I don't want to be rude to walk out. However, if I'm in a webinar, I have no trouble closing <laughs> down a browser. So yeah. always think of that as well. Um, but we'll send you this presentation so you can look at some of the feedback um, and also learn from it, hopefully. 
So there we have it. The Red Pack 2016 has been uncovered. Yes. Yes. Uh, so once again, if you have any questions, um, you can submit them in the chat box and we'll be answering them. And please feel free to complete the exit survey. Uh, thank you for joining us today. Thank you to Sarah and Michael. Thank you. Thank you very much. And we hope to see you next time. Thank Thanks, you. everyone. See you next time. Enjoy.